Well, I may as well make a Dev Diary video. Hello everyone, and welcome back to another Hearts of Iron 4 Dev Diary. We return after a short one to two week hiatus. Uh, we skipped a Dev Diary last week, but that's okay because I think this week's Dev Diary has some things that people are gonna be rather interested in. Uh, changes to how combat width works and such, but most of all, changes to the Soviet Union focus tree. That is specifically in regards to the Exiles branch, that is the Fash and Monarchist branch, with uh, quite a few new focuses, I have to add. So, without further ado, let's head into the Dev Diary. So, the Dev Diary begins by talking about combat, and to do this, they've roped back in Podcat to do so. Somebody who had just previously left the game has still got one foot in the doorway. Dan Lind is never too far away. So in a previous dev diary, there was discussions about how different types of terrain were going to have optimal amounts of combat width associated with them. These varied from like very low numbers in the teens to very high numbers, 20s uh, and above. Um, but this is talking about another change they're adding, which is about how targeting damage is going to work between divisions of different combat widths. So the crux of how this change works is that previously a 40 width division and a 20 width division would meet and the 40 width would just whack all of its attack power straight into the defense of the 20 width and, you know, humiliating it. Now, assuming that you've got more than one 20 width on that border, when the 40 width attacks the province, the attack damage of the 40 width is going to be divided between the two 20 widths therefore stopping it having, well, effectively double the amount of power of any division it faces. Tying this in with how the change is going to work with combat width in total, there won't necessarily be 40 and 20 whips to play with regardless. So adding all of these things together, it's kind of difficult to say what the future of combat's going to look like. I know this is definitely a hit for building like massive uh, 40 width huge tank divisions that just completely blitzkrieg through an enemy line because if the damage is going to be spread between different divisions it's going to be harder to do so but i think there's still going to be some room to play around with that unfortunately it's just one of those things we don't know until we see the update in addition there's also changes to how reinforcement works on a battle line which is no longer going to be in order of how you've selected and placed the units on the front line and how they uh, are fighting but now it's on a what i think <laughs> is a statistics based chance of a percentage made up of a base value of two and then things like radio and your doctrines can increase the chance that they're going to reinforce the front line from my interpretation of how this works that means that this is going to less involve people having to uh, micromanage bringing units off the front line and then sticking units in their place so that you've got a good uh, combat width not being extended as well as making sure that units on low attrition come back so that the new units can go in the front. It's going to be less about that I think and more so to do with making sure that the units that you want to reinforce have a good enough uh, reinforce rate so that they will automatically do so. That's how I think I interpret it, but uh, maybe I'm misinterpreting it. You can tell me. In addition, they also state that signal companies are going to be much more important for ensuring that they have the information to be able to reinforce on the front lines. But regardless of what any of this says, don't let this stop you from building your 17 width parachutist camel artillery divisions. This is your game and you can play it however you want to. Smiley face. <laughs> With that, we go on to the bread and butter of this dev diary, which is talking about some changes coming to the Exiles branch for the Soviet Union. So just as a reminder again, that's the Fash path and the Monarchist Tsarist path, which have got some new focuses. One sec, there's a dog barking. So this section begins by talking about how with the Exiles branch, you kind of face a, a difficult choice to make. On one hand, the notion of this happening is extremely unlikely. It's, it's works of fiction, effectively. So actually executing it would have been damn near impossible. And the game wants to reflect how difficult such a thing would be to do. To, for example, restart the Tsar Russia. On the flip side, 
this is a game and it's about having fun, not about grinding your nails into the wall in suffering. Although I'm sure there are some people on the subreddit who may disagree with me. Regardless, trying to balance the realism with the I just want to have fun playing a game is a difficult balance to make. And so maybe they're hoping that with some of these new focuses and reworks, it's going to really reflect the difficulty, but also make it more, let's say, engageable and able to interact with on a much more easy basis. So one thing that has changed is that previously you had a mechanic where you could recruit troops to your army in the Far East as you marched west towards Moscow, and in doing so you'd use political power. This has now changed that you now use command power, which is good because it is one of those mana that isn't too used. It was used with doctrines and changing templates, but using command power to just recruit units is another good way of balancing your resources. They've also made it so that when you try and get things from foreign countries, there are more options they have to support your cause, although we're not quite sure what that entails. So with that, we start with the opening of the Unification of the Exiles branch, which is about the civil war you're building up to while making sure that Stalin doesn't suppress you. As we can see here, there are two key notable focuses that have changed in the very center. There is the covert operations focus on the left, and the South Manchuria Railways focus there we see on the right. Both of these focuses are 35 days, with the covert operations focus unlocking decisions to frame party members and military personnel. This comes with the ability for you to make Stalin a little more concerned with his own army, and less so towards whatever you're doing in the East, buying you some time and also weakening the Red Army when you eventually come to fight it. The South Manchuria Railway is a little bit more what it says on the tin, it adds railways and supply hubs, which should make it that when you initially have to break out and start fighting, it shouldn't be as difficult with your supply, especially considering you're starting in the far east of Russia and Siberia. Not necessarily the best place to stick soldiers, especially not in winter. So, moving further down the unification of the Exiles branch, we have what they consider to be the most interesting rework to this branch, which is choosing between offering autonomy to the former Soviet republics or bringing the breakaways back into the fold. In short explanation, as you continue with a war against the Soviets, you're going to notice that different countries are going to start uprising in the west of Russia. Um, these are Ukraine, um, these are things in the Caucasus region. It can vary, and as such, you have options that you can choose to deal with them, such as befriending them as our enemy's enemy is our friend, or demanding that that is right for Russian territory, and you're not willing to give it up when this war is over. We get to see exactly that with a few countries being released. Um, we've got Ukraine on the left there. The Caucasus region is turning into a nightmare, as well as parts of Central Asia have started to rise up. We've got uh, Turkmenistan there, and I think the blue could be Uzbekistan. It's hard to see from where I am. Regardless of whether you choose to ally them or see them as an enemy, they are going to provide some assistance in providing less Soviet Union troops on your border, which everyone knows is helpful. Of course, then these focuses are going to decide what you want to do with them when all is said and done. With offer autonomy to the former Soviet republics, you can subjugate them and turn them into different puppets, assuming they want to become puppets, or you can go with the more aggressive route of just getting a retake or state war goal against them and uh, doing things in a little bit more militaristic manner. Overall, I think this is a kind of cool mechanic. I like the fact that chaos is erupting in other parts of the Soviet Union as this is all going on. I could imagine there are some pretty opportunistic peoples who would seek to sort of depart themselves from the Soviet if such an event was to occur. So keeping in touch with how the devs wanted to make the game less difficult but still realistic to how hard it was, there are other events that can occur, including enemy desertions, where soldiers are starting to desert from Stalin's army and come and join yours. So soldiers are flipping and you're gaining some soldiers is a good way to make it slightly easier, but um, it is definitely going to depend on how you micromanage that front. I think that's going to be the key regardless. At the end of the day, if you've got five troops with zero supply or a hundred troops with zero supply, it doesn't matter. They're going to get overrun and killed regardless, so yeah, more troops isn't always the best strategy. 
And so as we reach the end of this week's Dev Diary, we talk about what could be the most exciting part, which is the end of the Excels branch, which has had a pretty significant rework. So in the previous version of the focus tree, it was made that the Fash Russia would have more interests in conquering in the West, while a Cyrus Russia would have more focus on getting revenge on the Japanese. With the changes they've made now, both of these paths are available to both ideologies, regardless of which you pick. So what's great about this is, is that now, regardless of whatever ideology you pick at the end, you can still reclaim all the territory that the great Russian Empire might have once had, as well as also being able to exact the revenge on the Japanese after some long-held grudges you might have had. However, because the focuses now share a core component of what they both had, they have now decided to add more focuses, which will be unique to each ideology, to make sure they're, well, each individually unique. So a lot of the focuses we saw on the Exiles branch are pretty much the same as what they were previously. They do take note that the Lonely Island focus, though, will change if you become a puppet of the Japanese. If you find yourself becoming a puppet of the Japanese, and for whatever reason consider that to be a bad thing, you now have the Great Patriotic War of Independence. Um, the focus is in the same place, but the title and the effects have changed, and that allows you to become free, but the Japanese will have a war goal against you. So, kind of think about how Manchuria works, where they become independent and they have to fight the Japanese. Okay, and with that, let's see what new focuses they've added to make a more unique identity for the Tsarists and the Fash side. So the Tsarists get capital of the Tsars, which moves their capital to St. Petersburg and the beautiful palace that resides there, as well as getting tons of stuff in the state of Leningrad, sieves, antier, and a, what I think is a state modifier that increases construction speed. So you get four building slots in addition to whatever you have there now, meaning you can build up a massive industrial base inside of Leningrad. Although you will be getting a war goal on uh, Finland and varying countries in that region, so do be careful about naval invasions and the sort. In addition, the Saris will have focuses towards ensuring domination over the Balkan region so that they are the true defenders of the Slavs, including an actual domination focus with the fate of Romania, so that if you want to make sure that Russia has a uh, key presence inside of the Balkans, you can just take out Romania and then you're bordering all the Balkan nations. The final unique focus they show for the Tsarist side is the Iron Wall of Russian Resolve, which is a pretty military-based focus. Um, it gives you two military factories and reduces the ahead-of-time uh, penalty research for Super Heavy Tank. I also think it gives you a national spirit called the Iron Wall of Russian Resolve, which also makes the uh, production cost and reliability much better. So maybe there's a super heavy tank build that they're trying to advocate for here. I'm sure I'll let you all decide whether you want to do it. As for new focuses on the right side, the Russian corporate state allows you to get some new factories and industrial bonuses, as well as a way for you to create a Berlin-Moscow axis from the Russian side. This was previously a Germany thing, but now the Russians have the option to do so if they want as well. If you've managed to coerce the Germans into some sort of axis of uh, Russians and Germans, you also have the Japanese overtures focus, which allows you to ask if the Japanese would like to, you know, let bygones be bygones, it's all water under the bridge, and join the new Triumph, the, the free part axis, which has uh, completely ghosted Italy and uh, left Benito Mussolini behind. I mean, I'm not going to lie, an axis of Germany, the Soviets, and Japan might be a bit stronger without the soft underbelly of Europe, but um, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. As a shift to a more restrictive change, the Eastern Expansion Focus Path is now limited only to the fascist side, so going to war with the Americas and such is more so a less monarchist route to take. The key paths you can go down include going to war with Canada and USA to get back some old Russian territory in the region, I think they're referring to Alaska, as well as more so pushing towards the south of Russia into Iran, Turkey, and all the way down into the Middle East with Syria, and the British Raj if you're feeling up to it. 
and with that we come to the closing points of the dev diary. The good thing about getting closer towards release day is a lot of the art starts getting done and we get to see some of the portraits that we'll be seeing when we play as the countries. So here we can see a collection of generals, mostly wearing hats but one guy's going full bald. As well as that we also get to see Tsar Vladimir I who's got a very, you know, strong looking face. He's He's definitely seen some stuff, he's, he's ready to go, with the Emperor and Autocrat of all the Russias as his uh, buff, giving small war support, small resistance growth, and the required garrisons goes down, which is an interesting buff when you're playing as the Soviets and have quite a lot of manpower to spare anyway, but um, fair enough to him. If you're going for a more religious path, however, we have the Arch Patriarch Militius. God, I can still not say that. Who is Defier of the Sun God, giving division recovery rate, as well as some buffs to attacking Japan, because goodness knows we don't like Japan. He's also the supreme representative of God on Earth, with <laughs> much better stability, much better war support, and a complete refusal on ideology drift defense. Um, are we just going to admit that the Archpatriarch is significantly better than the Tsar? I, I feel like it's staring us in the face that this guy is like... It's the beard. It's the, it's the Father Christmas beard that's giving this man his power. Okay, and with that we reach the end of the Dev Diary. Is it just me or has the formatting changed? I feel like in the time that I've made this video, the format has changed. Regardless, I will say thank you very much for watching. Um, I hope you found this informative. Usually we go through the comments. Um, there wasn't too much that I could see to talk about, except that when you do take over cities as, uh, let's say, the monarchists, Leningrad and Stalingrad will have an event to be renamed to St. Petersburg and whatever. So there will be some uh, <laughs> changes to do with localization. But other than that, nothing too interesting. So yeah. Thank you very much for watching, I hope you enjoyed. If you like, feel free to like, feel free to subscribe, and um, goodness knows when we're going to get a release date. I'll see you all next time. As an aside, I'm still in queue for New World. This is, this is ridiculous. Bye.